worship this morning, uh, the good gift that we're bringing to God. Uh, I am wearing a pink stole today. If you've been around in Advent, I wore this uh, on Rose Sunday during Advent. Uh, it was a gift for me from Monsignor across the street, a uh, uh, Catholic priest friend of mine. And um, David told me when he gave it to me that I could also wear it on one of the Lenten Sundays. And that was like four years ago, and I, and I never remember which Lenten Sunday he said. So this morning I happened to look it up, and it is the fourth Sunday in Lent that you get to wear red, rose, and um, it is, I wrote it down, Le Tori Sunday. That's Latin, and I don't know what that means. But what it said was that you can relax the rigors of Lent on this Sunday. You can relax the rigors of Lent. And I'm also allowed to marry people today, so... If you want to get married, let me know, and we'll take care of that, too. So it's a good gift, a good gift, a, a, a chance to wear my rose robe. Why don't we stand? We're asking the question, where is God? So we have some good Trinity songs to sing this morning. We'll start with hymn 413. begin singing.
Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Bend your ears to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us all. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into our darkest hour and into our hearts. And anoint us with your spirit, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit. One God now. You may be seated. when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. The word of the Lord. God, my God. 
God am I forsaken? Why turn from me your eyes? Why cease to know my anguish or hear my heartfelt cries? My God, my God. The faithful ones before me found favor by their trust. While I despise, tormented, am cast into the dust. My God, my God. With scorn my foes deride me, their taunts my faith would move. Yet firm in my conviction, deep rooted in your love, my God, my God. Forsaken me. My God, my sure salvation, be near me all my days. Whatever may befall me, remain my strength always. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. For once you were darkness, and now in the Lord you are light. Light as children of light, excuse me, live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, and instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord. In the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Let us pray. Your good and gracious God, we pray for your presence among us in this space. We sing praises, hear your word, gather together. We pray that you send us out from this space and shine your light in the dark places, knowing that you are with us wherever we're at. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week we continue uh, our sermon series uh, on essential questions uh, in our lives, questions that we, we probably ask at one time or another. And the question this week is, where is God? Uh, a pretty big question, one that we've probably asked, though, at some point in our lives, I would imagine. Uh, and it's a question we often ask when we think about suffering whether it's suffering going on in our life, whether it's suffering going on in the lives of the ones we love, or whether it's uh, suffering going on just in the world that we see. You know, this was a question that I wrestled with a lot when I was a chaplain at Children's Hospital uh, almost 10 years ago now. And I'll never forget a mom asking me at, at 2 in the morning, when I came into the room, a mom asked me where God was. She wanted answers because she saw her her poor nine-year-old daughter laying in bed stricken with cancer. And my heart broke because I didn't have any good answers for her that evening, in early morning. So together we just shed tears at the injustice of it all. And we wonder where God is when children, the most innocent in our society, suffer. And it isn't one of our texts this morning, but I had it on my mind when I thought about this question. The story of Lazarus, where Jesus arrives after Lazarus has died, and, and Lazarus' sister Martha provides Jesus with a, a very human response, similar to the one that woman was asking in Children's Hospital. Jesus, if you were here, surely this would not have happened. My brother would not be dead now. God, if only you were here, this nine-year-old would be able to worry about homework and recess instead of lying in bed stricken with cancer. The suffering and pain that is around us would not be present if you were here. So we wrestle with this question, where is God? Just as people like Martha have done for generations and as the psalm spoke to this morning, as Jesus asked that question himself, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where is God? So even Jesus wrestled with this question. And as I thought about this question, I, I saw a quote this week that stuck with me. Walter Brueggemann's an Old Testament scholar, and he, he just generally knows just a lot about a lot of things. He's, he's a really wise man. And he had a, a quote that he said, Few people imagine God to be an active character in the midst of their lives. Few people imagine God to be an active character in the story of their lives. And he's not talking about just, just anyone. He's talking about church people, people of faith. And that doesn't mean people don't believe in God, but rather God day in and day out seems pretty passive. That is, if God is doing anything, God is sitting back and waiting and watching and, and being supportive, kind of like God is at a sporting event. Not really able to affect the outcome of the actual event, but watching and cheering on from the sidelines. I bet Mittler had a, a famous song back in, I looked it up, 1990, that spoke to this. And I won't ruin your Sunday morning by singing it to you, but... But the lyrics went something like this. God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. The sense that, that God is somewhere out there, but it seems like God is, is pretty far away from here, present with us in the midst of our everyday lives. But that's not the biblical picture that we get of God. Certainly God watches, but God also creates, as we read about in 
the first chapter of Genesis this morning. Uh, God, or at least the, the very angel of God, wrestles with Jacob in the Old Testament. God journeys with the Israelites throughout the Old Testament in a cloud and, and through many other things. God speaks from heaven on the top of a mountain that we read about just a few weeks ago in the story of the Transfiguration. Uh, God tells everyone that Jesus is God's beloved son when Jesus is baptized. God's in constant conversation with, with all the big wigs of the Old Testament and Moses and Joseph and Elijah. We can certainly say that this biblical God does all kinds of things great and small, mighty, mundane, or miraculous. God is constantly at work in the world. And more than that, God regularly uses people to point out and tell what God is doing. God works through people all over the biblical witness. And I think it still happens today. But I think it, it looks a little different. So it means that, that we've got to keep our eyes open. This week you might have heard uh, about a, a third grader from Colorado named uh, Cameron Renfro, who shaved her head to support a classmate who was going through cancer treatments. The story made national news, not for Cameron's act, but for her school board, uh, kicking her out of school for going against dress code by shaving her head. Uh, but Delaney, the friend who has cancer, said she was overwhelmed that even one of her best friends would be willing to do this. Because during a time in their lives where appearance means a whole lot, that if you don't look or act a certain way, you're, you're kind of pushed out, that this little girl, this third grader, was willing to step outside of that pressure and willing to walk beside her friend so that her friend wasn't feeling alone. And I think this is what the kingdom of God looks like. God is still active, using people to point out and tell what God is doing. Because I think this is where God meets us, in the messiness of our lives. God's, God doesn't dwell in a, in a galaxy far, far away, but God is present with us in third grade girls who shave their heads on behalf of third grade classmates just to show love and compassion. There's a great scene from the movie Walk the Line, the a movie about Johnny Cash's life, uh, where he's going to uh, the audition, the, his first audition with his band, and he confronts the owner of the recording studio and asks for an audition, and the, the owner reluctantly gives this audition to him. And he gets there with his band, and they're all wearing black shirts because it's the only color they have that's, that's the same color shirt. And, and he starts to play a gospel tune. And you can tell in the first few notes that the record company guy isn't buying it. He's unhappy with it. He doesn't find it interesting. And, and he finally stops Johnny Cash and says, are you really going to do this? Are you really going to just sit and sing the same song that we've heard over and over again? This, this Jesus by and by, is this what you're going to tell me? And Johnny Cash says, well, what are you saying, that, that I don't believe in Jesus? The, and the recording guy says, no, 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 I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying this doesn't mean anything. This song is clearly not something that means anything to you. There's nothing here. Well, what do you mean, Johnny Cash asks him. And he says, what I mean is, is this a song you would sing? If this is the last song you had and, and you were lying in a gutter and, and you were going to die and you had one last song to sing to God before you were dirt, this is the song you'd sing? By and by, Jesus is with me? He says, it doesn't mean anything unless it comes from your heart. Unless it comes from your own broken experience is essentially what he is saying. Johnny Cash wanted to keep singing this gospel song that, that clearly did not work for him. It didn't speak to the people that were hearing it. it. Clearly, it didn't speak through Johnny Cash. It didn't come from a place of vulnerability or brokenness. It was just another song that, that this record producer could tell right away that Cash's heart wasn't into. So instead, he had Cash sing a song that he had just written called Folsom Prison Blues. You've probably heard of that one that had an incredible grief within it, that spoke to Cash's own pain, and, and there's this incredible significance that's born out of this, that spoke to Cash's own broken experience and his own yearning. And he became known for being able to touch something deep inside people with his music. And I think this is where God shows up as well. In the midst of our own brokenness, in, in the midst of our yearnings, and I think this is why worship is such an important experience in the midst of our lives as Christians. 
Because God meets us here in this space, gathered together with, with other people in the midst of their own broken experiences and their own yearnings, where we sing praises, where we hear, hear the word of God proclaimed, where we look one another in the eyes and proclaim peace and gather together around bread and wine that is the very body and blood of Christ. There are many moving parts that go into planning worship and many people that are involved in that here at Messiah. But I think all of us would say that, that if one thing happens, if God is present, we can truly say we've worshipped. I think one of the interesting things that, uh, that happens for me uh, when I go away on vacation is that I have a choice on Sunday mornings. Obviously not something I normally have because it's part of my job to be here on Sunday mornings to see all of you lovely people. But when I'm on vacation, I have a choice. Do I go to church? Do I sleep in? Do I, do I lounge around in, in my boxers and watch Sports Center eating a bowl of cereal? Or maybe continue to read a book? Sorry to be graphic. Uh, but it's a decision that you get to make every single week. Do I get the kids out of bed? Do I, do I take this one opportunity to be able to sleep in? Do I venture out into yet another snowstorm? Doesn't God know that it's like two days away from April? Holy cow. And maybe this is a question that goes through your head every single week, something that you struggle with, you wrestle with. Maybe this is a question you just deal with from time to time. But I know this is something that, that I've wrestled with on Sunday mornings when I've had a choice. And to be honest with you, there's times when the bed is too comfortable to get up. And there's times when the book is too good to put down. And so I stay home. And I was faced again with this question when I was on vacation in Arizona just a couple of weeks ago. So it made me think, why do I go to church? Why do I go to church? And what I came up with was this. I'm gonna, I'll be a little confessional this morning. I've come to believe that the good news is just too hard to believe for more than seven days in a row. I've come to believe that the good news is just too hard to believe for more than seven days in a row. And what I mean by that is that each and every week we hear the news that God who created and still sustains this vast cosmos not only knows that both you and I exist, but actually cares about you and me. More than that, God cares deeply and passionately about our ups and downs, our ins and outs, our hopes and our heartbreaks, our successes and our failures. And even more than that, God cares about us enough to send us Jesus so that we might know and believe just how much God loves us. That news is so good, it, it almost sounds too good to be true. And while it might sound great on Sunday morning when, when you leave this place full by Friday, and some weeks quite a bit earlier, maybe by the time you leave the parking lot and the, and the kids start fighting in the back seat because one of them is breathing the same air as the other one, this good news seems hard to believe. And so we go back to church week in and week out to hear the good news of God's love, God's forgiveness, and God's grace, that we might leave encouraged to believe it and even harder to, to live that out for one more week. Because God is present here in this community full of broken experiences and yearnings. And so when I hear this question, where is God? I suppose my answer changes probably from time to time, but uh, this Sunday morning my answer is this. Where is God? God is present in the suffering of that nine-year-old lying in a hospital bed suffering from cancer. Where is God? God is walking with Delaney, that third grader from Colorado who, who has cancer, embodied and her friend who's walking beside her, who's shaved her head just to show that she loves her and cares about her. Where is God? God is present with us here in this community that we call Messiah Lutheran Church and, and the people that are gathered in this space this morning. Where is God? God is with us in the person of Jesus, that we meet in the bread and wine, the very body and blood of Christ, who God sent to us to show us how much God loves us and cares for us. I know there will be time, as there have been in my own life, and I'm sure yours as well, when we ask this question, where is God? We hear silence on the other end. 
And I don't think there's any magic formula that's going to take away this yearning and this question in our lives. Because there will be times when it will feel like God is far away or not present at all, seemingly. But my hope, and I think our hope collectively, is that in these moments of despair and suffering, that God shows up in the people that are able to walk beside us and embody God for us, just as hopefully we've been able to do the same thing for, for people who feel like God is far away from them. Because this is where God is present with us, in the suffering and pain and loneliness that we experience. And God is present with us in a few moments when we gather together and once again break bread in the very body and blood of Christ. And that gives us hope to go out for another week and live this out. Amen. Please stand. We're going to sing Spirit of Gentleness, hymn 396. And we're going to use the refrain for our prayers that will follow immediately after.
returning to the Lord with all our heart. Let us pray for the whole people of God, the earth, and all who cry out for help and healing. Creator God, allow us to see you in all things. We ask that you continue to bless our lives with your presence. Gift us with the strength and courage to follow you while showing the world your grace and forgiveness. We ask that you constantly remind us that we are your loved children and that we are forgiven. God, you alone know our pains and ailments. Through your compassion, grant those suffering the peace that only you can provide. We especially pray for Pastor Joe, Pastor Michael, Keith, Denise, Kimberly, Harlan, Donna, Jack, Meg, Maddie, Kathleen, Donna, Beth, and all those we lift up to you out loud or in the silence of our hearts now. God of love, shepherd all your people. Break down the barriers of hatred and prejudice against those of different races, faiths, genders, age, ability, and sexual orientation that we can live in peace together throughout the world. Hear us, O God, according to your steadfast love, and in your great compassion bring us to resurrection and rebirth in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share that side of peace with one another. God's peace.
saying as we received this offering that was given. Let us pray. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with the words of grace and life. Bless us and bless these your gifts which we receive from your bounty. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
of our weary years, God of our silent tears. You have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the very path of love and light. In every age, you have sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullest of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcasts and the despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it for his disciples a drink, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let the church say amen. Amen. Send your Holy Spirit now, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Spirit of Freedom, and let the church say amen. Amen. Join our prayers and praise with the prophets and martyrs of every age that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and the hope of your Son. Through him, with him, in him, and the glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. the table that God has set. Please be seated. We'll commune our assistants first and we'll bring this meal for everyone to eat.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. God of mercy, we give you thanks for serving us with the food of eternal life. Send us out now to awaken others to the mystery of your love, which is revealed to all the world, and the one who came to give himself away, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have a, a few announcements, and while we're doing that, our, our men are going to line up. They're going to sing the amen for our benediction, our closing benediction. Uh, we're in the season of Lent as I started off the service, so that means on Wednesday nights uh, you have a special invitation. Not only can you come and get a great meal at 5.30, and uh, education at 6.30. Laura Book, uh, Thad's wife, is teaching a class with some seminary uh, help about living out your vocation. At 7.30 you can come for the worship service, uh, about 40 minute, 35 minute worship service, a uh, good peaceful uh, evening service uh, to help your Lenten journey. We're doing a sermon series on that using a uh, book called The Last Week where we're literally going through the last week of uh, Christ and using the uh, Gospel of Mark. So we're on Wednesday this week. It's uh, been interesting, for, I know, for Thad and I to, uh, as we've been working on it. So I'll lift all that up. If it's l Lent, that means Easter is right after. So we have Easter lilies that are, uh, you can buy, $6.50. There are envelopes in the pews. Uh, I think this might be the last uh, Sunday that you can do that. They're to decorate our sanctuary on Easter morning, to decorate your house after Easter. You can take them home with you and to be a good gift for our visitors uh, and members when they come on that morning. So lift all that up. And we have Easter breakfast on Easter morning. It's been a tradition, a long time tradition here. Uh, we're under new management for the Easter breakfast, which means we're, we're kind of uh, need new people to, to step forward. So if you if you want to help out, you don't have to help out the whole morning, but if you can help out for a couple hours on Easter morning for the breakfast, that would be fantastic. Uh, you can call Susan Fryer, you can call the church office, and, and they'll get you in touch with Susan. Newsletters are out for the month of April. It starts in just a few days. So uh, you should have gotten that through email. If you didn't get that through email, and that is a possibility for your world, then you need to contact us and give us your right email address. Uh, and we will do that. You can also go on our website and look there. And if you are still people that use paper, then you could pick up paper ones on the desk out in the Welcome Center as you're leaving. Uh, there's uh, plenty of them out there too. So lift all that up. Um, and then the final thing to announce is... <laughs> and that's right, that is our French chef Francois Fromage who is uh, preparing chickens for all of you. So, uh, so if you have chickens, you might want to hide them because we are cooking them up. For April 12th chicken noodle dinner, uh, come, the seniors are sponsoring it. They're cooking homemade everything, mashed potatoes, noodles, uh, chickens, and everything else. So good, good, good food. $8 for a ticket. If you buy it before the, the evening of the 12th, $9 at the door. So you save a buck by buying a ticket before you leave home today. So lift all that up for you. Uh, with all that, please stand for our blessing. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you all with favor and grant you God's peace. with the song about where God is, God of tempest, God of whirlwind, hymn 400.
Thank you.